I am a composer, and that means that my research activity mostly consists of writing music and getting performances. I'm currently writing a piece that's setting a poem that is uh, the theme of climate change by Kathy um, Jetnell Kishner. Uh, Dear Mata Philippinum. I can't present it because it's in process, but instead I'm going to give a, a highly selective overview of some of the interactions of um, art and climate change. In particular, maybe to give some context to this, um, to see what are the differences between how a scientist or a politician or an activist engaging with climate change and how, um, and how an artist might do. And in particular, to draw out the tensions between um, activism and art. So does anybody, can you hear the music playing? It's really quiet. Can we turn the music up a little bit? Okay. Does anybody recognize this piece? Way in the back. Yeah. Very good. Uh, <laughs> see me afterwards for your prize. Um, <laughs> So this is the Czech composer Smetna, and the piece, um, we're about to get the theme, right? I don't want to talk over it. <laughs> Keeps coming. Anyway, it's a symphonic tone poem that is inspired by this river, runs through Prague and other uh, areas of the Czech Republic. And these fast moving passages and the winds and the strings are an obvious, and there's a the theme, or as an obvious um, metaphor for the running of the water. And this is a pretty, co um, pretty common musical metaphor of babbling brooks and flowing rivers and things like this. Um, and in the 19th century, you get a lot of this, and it is often accompanied by a nostalgia for one's homeland, childhood, or for a mythical, simpler time in the past when people were more in tune with nature. And you can see this just in the titles of movements from Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. Um, cheerful feelings arrive on arriving in the countryside. The townsfolk flee the city, and uh, just like people do now on vacations, uh, seen by the brook. A uh, merry gathering of country folk, a dramatic movement of a thunder and a storm, and then the pleasant aftermath when they're thankful they've made it through the storm. Um, so let's jump ahead quite a bit uh, over a lot of good protest music, but this is, um, I think probably this could be considered the theme song of, of uh, climate action, Melissa Etheridge's I Need to Wake Up, which was incorporated in Al Gore's um, documentary and movie, An Inconvenient Truth. I believe it was written for that. Uh, the, the graphic of 2005 being the hottest year is sort of depressingly quaint uh, with this. This would fall under a, a category of, I would say, inspirational rock anthem, right? It's the idea, and the, and the subject here is climate change and the idea of, of uh, calling on individuals to wake up, to think about what's going on, to consider their own part of the problem, and then to act, to speak out. Um, this is similar to another, an earlier uh, environmental advocacy song, Michael Jackson's Earth Song. There's a lot more angst here. He's in the throes in the middle of this uh, dystopian environmental landscape. Uh, at the end of the video, though, there's things kind of go backwards and you kind of regenerate and things, there's hope. And, but the relationship between advocacy and um, and art is complicated. This is a quote from Seamus Heaney, the um, famous Irish poet. No lyric has ever stopped a tank, which I think is probably true. Uh, poems don't stop uh, um, pipelines. They don't stop oil tankers and things like that. But it's a little more complicated. He says, in one sense, the efficacy of poetry is nil. No lyric has ever stopped a tank. In another sense, it is unlimited. It is like the writing in the sand in the fact of which accusers and accused are left speechless and renewed. And I might circle back to, I think it was Dr. McCoy was talking about the difficulty in science of communicating with the public. Well, for artists, it's a little bit the opposite. Uh, an artist should be comfortable communicating with the public, at least in their chosen medium. But what's being communicated isn't, um, isn't specific. So it's more like, and that's the image here of the writing in the sand, and people see it, and they sort of 
think about it and they come away with what their individual response will be. Um, the obvious follow-up to this would be, if a poem can't stop a tank, can it stop an SUV? And uh, Heaney says, I think that one answers itself. Um, but more to the point, he says, at this stage, nobody can have an uncomplicated Hopkinsian trust in the self-refreshing powers of nature. And this, uh, if you look back at the Smetna and the Beethoven, these are relatively uncomplicated references to nature. They're not bothered by it. You really can't do that anymore. Um, <clears throat> here is uh, a less inspirational response. This is uh, by French for Rabbits, Claim by the Sea, where the singer is lamenting that her home by the sea is no longer her home. It has been claimed by rising tides. This is, a, um, this is an indie pop group. This is a kind of dreamy fatalism in a way, but it gives space for grief, which is a uh, natural response to coming to terms with, uh, with the problem. Um, another, another response is anger. And so here we'll take, uh, listen to a bit of Mostef with a, a song, New World Water, that's highlighting issues of water scarcity. And in particular, the, um, in, in some places, noting the role of global warming in this. There's some dark humor in the opening setting this up. Trying to move the dial forward on climate action, they're simply responding to it and giving voice to their grief or anger or whatever. Um, if we pivot to uh, an, a composer of contemporary classical music, which is my own um, style of music, uh, this is John Luther Adams, who moved to Alaska in his early 20s and was a composer and also an activist before he decided to focus solely on composition. And his work, Become Ocean, won a Pulitzer, won a Grammy. Um, and he describes it as an ocean of sound. And in particular, there are th the orchestra is divided into three large ensembles. And each of those ensembles has its own periodic swelling and uh, rising and falling. And sometimes they rise and fall together. And he says, these are big tsunamis of sound when all the crests of all the waves coincide. Um, I, I don't want to geek out on music theory here. This is from a, a chart by uh, Alex Ross, who's a music critic for The New Yorker. And you can see the three layers there, and you can see each of those uh, things like that as a harmonic swell, uh, a dynamic swell. And they each go on their own period, and sometimes they are opposed, and sometimes they work together. Uh, I put this, I made this graph uh, after the first session, so my, my presentation would seem more scientific. You can see. Uh, <laughs> you can see that there are places where the sinusoids uh, come together. One, two, three. There are other aspects of this and where he's, he's sort of trying to get at the idea of the ocean. There are a lot of palindromes here. The whole piece is a palindrome. Each swell is a palindrome. So he's playing around with time and, uh, and things working against each other and coming together. Uh, but there's also this complicated relationship to the ocean, uh, basically, we humans find ourselves facing the prospect that once again, we may quite literally become ocean. This was something that was cited in the um, Pulitzer Prize Committee and something that Alex Ross himself talks about. He describes this as uh, maybe the loveliest apocalypse in musical history, which is, is possibly true. So what I'd like to do is play um, part of this so you can get a sense. It's a very long piece, there's really one essential idea that's unfolding over the time is so this invites the listener to, um, to kind of lose themselves in this expanse of time. I won't play all 50 minutes. I'll give you, I'll give you a little bit of the central swell.
Okay. Um, before I finish, I'd like to touch on data sonification. Uh, I really enjoy this image. It's like the person has their headphones plugged directly into uh, an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so the idea here is in, in um, analogy with data visualization, uh, ways of presenting information by sound. This is an old idea. Um, some very familiar examples where you have chimes that ring every quarter hour. They're different than Westminster quarters. That's data sonification. Geiger counters are very simple. Uh, sonification. Auditory displays such as sonograms are also data sonification. Now there are more complicated ways to do this and scientists and people who are working in the field are using, are exploring this. It's a complicated situation. If you Google climate change sound, you will get a lot of, uh, uh, what do they call this? Links, yeah, whatever. Um, uh, that will say something like the sound of climate change. Well, there is not the sound of climate change. There are interpretations of the data, and this is actually kind of complicated. How do you map data, numerical data, to musical elements? Do you apply low numbers or high numbers to low and high pitches? Well, if you do, are they discrete? Meaning uh, they could be mapped onto notes of the piano. If they're gonna be mapped onto notes of the piano, you're gonna have to round. Are they gonna be with white and black keys, chromatic? They're gonna be only on the white keys, diatonic. Are they gonna be continuous frequency? Uh, are you gonna do this in time? Is it gonna be tempo? Is it gonna be timbre? And what do you do if you've got multiple streams of data? And how do you present that in a coherent manner, which uh, touches on musical counterpoint, which is actually something that's quite difficult to master. Um, so here's an example. This is from the uh, Stanford Center for Computer Music, Re from Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, or uh, generally referred to as CARMA. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a relatively straightforward data sonification. You're going to hear two layers. One is a drone that corresponds to CO2 levels, and the other are these like little plucking sounds that correspond to average temperatures. And this happens from I think the 1600s into 2016. I'll skip forward on some of these. Not much change through the mid 1700s. A little more CO2, a little bit higher um, sounds in the plucking. And maybe we'll let this play out for the next 100 plus years. Um, it's the same information that's presented in the familiar hockey stick visualization. Uh, there's something about the increase in pitch, the increase in uh, volume that elicits a, a kind of involuntary intensity in the psychological response. Um, so this is a pretty, um, I would say, pretty direct sonification. I'm going to skip over another one that I think is really good and move on to um, uh, a climate change opera by a composer Matthew Bertner who grew up in Alaska. There's a strong Alaska connection um, with composers involved in this. There's, uh, I won't go into the details, there's a more complicated mapping of data to musical elements. You see here chords, big chords um, coming from that. You see the data, this is actually the score and the data is actually generating a lot of structural elements. Um, and so let's, I'll, I'll let you listen to a little bit of it. You'll hear sounds of ice breaking and things that are, that are um, a part of the piece. You'll also, someone is playing water, a water bowl, which is uh, signifying the uh, melting snow and ice.
Okay. In the interest of time, uh, I think that I'll let it be the end there. This is just a very select um, list of some of the um, musical works that respond to climate change, but there's quite a lot out there. Thank you very much.